You may be seated. Would you take your Bible and turn to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 7. 1 Samuel, chapter 7. Uh, to all our musicians and Bernie, your team, Zane, all of the great folks in the sound booth on in the back, thanks for um, uh, just uh, being ready. Just being ready. Uh, it wasn't really scheduled. I just really felt led of the Lord that this is the direction that we should go for tonight. And um, I appreciate um, you, each and every one of you, uh, being prepared and being ready to, to just jump in and serve and sounding beautiful. Absolutely great. And some of you actually look good. Bernie, no. But the rest of you look, look really good. And I'm very, very thankful. It's midweek. I'm going to have to work hard. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 7 in your Bible. As we come to 1 Samuel chapter 7, it's the, um, the nation of Israel is what is historically called the, the period of the judges. Matter of fact, um, we are in the history book uh, one of the history books of the Old Testament, there's, uh, you have the Pentateuch, the giving of the law, the, the Genesis account, and then you have the judges, uh, the historical books of the Bible. Then you have the poetical books, which would be like Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. And First Samuel is, is um, in the historical section to give us insight into what's going on. And and um, we don't preach uh, a lot, uh, I should say, out of the Old Testament, but it doesn't mean the Old Testament's not of equal value. You don't understand Christ if you don't understand the Old Testament. And there's been uh, some people have made statements like, I don't think you really need the Old Testament. When several people have come out recently and they've said, made statements like this, the words in the Bible to really, that are really important are the words in red, because those are Jesus's words. Let me just set the record straight for every one of you. The entire Word of God is Jesus' words. <laughs> They're all His. Uh, in the beginning was the Word, was the Logos, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. This is as much the Word of Jesus Christ as uh, John chapter 3, verse number 16. Now, we have to interpret them a little bit differently. We understand them as far as their, their implications a little bit differently, but you don't understand the New Testament if you don't grasp the Old Testament. And so there is an absolute importance for this in our lives. This is a time when God used a man in the judges period, when God would use a man to lead the nation. They were without a king, uh, and the nation of Israel was constantly getting in trouble. There were some famous, famous judges. Uh, some were famous for how good they were, the good things they did. Maybe a guy like Jephthah or even a lady like Deborah, because no man would step up. And then there were infamous judges, uh, people like Samson, or as we come to our text, uh, one of the infamous slash good judges was a man by the name of Eli. He was a nice enough guy, just to give you the history of him, but he was a really bad father. Like, like good enough dude, like you'd want to sit down and have coffee with him and hear his stories and hear all the things going on in his life, but you wouldn't want to follow his parenting advice. He had two crummy sons that the Bible says he really never disciplined. He never taught them the things of God. They, they stole from the temple. They stole from the people of God. They abused the women in Israel. I mean, they were just, they were just for lack of a better term, they were bums, and uh, he just allowed it to go on. He wasn't even a strong leader in the nation of Israel, and there were consequences for both the nation of Israel and his family because of his, listen to what I'm about to say, his poor, feckless leadership. We we're talking with some friends today, and I was just a little bit fired up about some stuff going on in our country, and I was reminded, and I said these words. I said, well, as the leader, so the nation we probably ought not be too surprised. It's not a Democrat or Republican issue. If you'd been here five years ago, you would have heard me say some things about as the leaders of the nation. And we see a problem. And Eli, was he was not strong in his spiritual leadership. He was rather weak. And 
As we come to this text, the nation of Israel had been at war with the Philistines for many years. And the Philistines were winning the lion's share of the battles and conquering the nation of Israel. And there was a particular battle that is talked about in 1 Samuel chapter 4, in which the nation of Israel was fighting in a town called Ebenezer, a town seven miles east of the Mediterranean Sea. And during the battle, they were losing the battle. And the things weren't going well, and, and they were desperate. I mean, they were big time desperate to win this battle. And so the battle is fierce, and, and they bring out the Ark of the Covenant, hoping in a desperate way that God will provide for them victory because they brought the Ark of the Covenant. Let me say this. They were trying to reverse engineer the power and the presence of God in the nation of Israel. You can't reverse engineer the moving of God. Uh, I've, I've grown up in churches, and I can remember, Lynn, you're probably old enough, maybe a few other people in here, I know you're old enough, that we grew up here and in the 70s about Jack Van Impey and the late great planet Earth. Remember that? There was a big conference when I was a kid. So there's like nine of us that know who Jack Van Impey is. The rest of you are Googling him right now. Uh, but I was a kid. Gloria will remember this, and we went to the, they had a big crusade at the Tacoma Convention Center. My dad pastored in Spanaway. My dad was a part of the, the team that went there, and, and they had all of these special teams set up to do certain things, and the idea was that if we have a prayer team, an evangelism team, if we have a, a, a calling team, there was no internet back then. It was, it was you know, not yet planned or, or, or done, and, and so if we have all of these teams, then this will be the product of of all of this effort. Well, you can't reverse engineer revival. And if you go to Tacoma, Washington today, you will see a very, very wicked city. The revival did not happen. And you say, well, maybe it happened back then, Pastor, you're old. No, I can still remember there wasn't a change in the culture at all. They were trying, and, and good, well-meaning people. Well, the, the, we'll do that often. And the guys in Israel that are fighting in, in Ebenezer are, are trying to win this battle, so they bring the Ark of the Covenant out. Well, it doesn't go well for Israel. In that battle, Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are both killed. And later in the battle, the Ark of the Covenant was captured. Eli is told in the account that his two sons have died, and he is gravely sad. He's sitting, it seems from the text, he's sitting on a log of sorts, a, a chair without a back maybe, and then somebody tells him that the Ark of the Covenant had been captured as well. And as soon as Eli hears that the Ark of the Covenant had been captured, he was an old man, he was a very heavy man, and uh, when he heard that, he fell from his bench backwards, hit his neck, and there he died. His daughter-in-law, who was pregnant, standing there, and she has a baby, hearing that his, her husband has died, and she goes into labor, and she dies. But before she dies, she names her son Ichabod, meaning the glory has departed. If we had time, we would talk about this, but I mean, just suffice it to say that it is one of the saddest accounts in the Bible, and certainly the saddest account in a in a history of sad accounts for Eli and his family. Because Eli's family is a picture of the condition of the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel was in deep sin. They were making ungodly and unwise and sinful decisions in their walk with the Lord. And we come to chapter 7, and God has chosen Samuel to be the spiritual leader and the political leader, the judge of the nation. And in chapter 7, we see that Samuel calls the nation of Israel to revival. They were in need of revival. Now, you might be new to church and say, okay, pastor, you use this word revival. What does it mean? Revival has many definitions, and most of them, I'm, I'm sure, get at some part of the definition. And it's, it's hard to put words into define because of the supernatural working of God on the surrendered heart of man is, is 
not easily quantified, but this is how I would define it. Revival happens is a recovering, a repairing, or a restoring of our relationship with God. Revival is a recovering, a repairing, or a restoring of our relationship with God. Re revival really only happens for believers. Unbelievers can't be revived because they've never been made alive. And so revival restores us, revival recovers us, revival repairs our relationship with God. And because the church is made up of people, and people who live in a sin-cursed world, facing the sinful challenges of this world, let's all be honest, it's easy to drift apart from the Lord. It's easy to be close to the Lord and not too long later feel very, very distant from Jesus. You, you can have a, what some preachers call a mountaintop experience on Sunday and then be kind of in the spiritual dungeon on Monday. Some of you even in this room at, at times have felt like God's really moving in your heart and really doing a work, but over a period of time, you just become a little bit less committed and then a little bit less inspired and a little bit less excited and a little bit less passionate. And given over a period of time, if you're honest, you can look back and go, dude, I was way over there a while ago. I've had people say things like this to me over the years, Pastor. You have no idea how involved I was years ago. And what happened? Just time happened. And I would submit to you that there was no corporate call for inspection and revival. There was no corporate call to look at yourself and to be introspective and say, I need to be restored to where I once was, to the joy I once had, to the peace I once enjoyed, to the love that I once felt. And, and, and truth be told, dude, we're all in that boat from time to time. It's not like, oh, pastor, how about people say, what's it like to never struggle spiritually? I'm like, I don't know. I'll tell you when we get to heaven. But if you're not there, I'm not telling. Because I ain't coming for a visit. But what's it like? No, no, we all go through this. That's why I, I just believe I'm committed to this, that the church has a responsibility for corporate, we could even call it this, corporate restoration services. A, a corporate repair agenda. A corporate recovery time. A time when we just get apart and we try to recover to be closer to the Lord than we currently are. Don't you think it's a sad thing that the closest most people are to the Lord is when they first get saved? Because I remember when I first got saved, how on fire I was how committed I was, how excited I was, how great things were, how wonderful things were. I mean, those were the days. I remember I couldn't wait to get home and read my Bible. I remember I couldn't wait to get home and talk to somebody about Jesus. But that was now several years ago. And now I just kind of, I go home and I can't wait to take a nap. And I go home and I can't wait to do this. And I can't wait to do that. And I'm not against naps or doing this or that. But, but isn't it sad? I mean, if you really think about it, that the best spiritual days you're, you had were years ago. Can I tell you, that's not God's idea. God's idea is that the best days would be today and tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And in truth, if we're not in a state, and I want to be careful when I say this, but if we're not in a state of growing love and affection for the Lord, then we are definitely in need of revival. 
I would submit to you that if I gave you a blind survey and you answered it honestly, that you would probably say this, I am in need of revival. I've gotten occupied with this, and I've got occupied with that, and I got focused on this. And, I, and, and life, I get it. I get it. I'm not, there's no condemnation. Those things really do happen. That's why it's imperative that we don't allow this to go for years on end without an encouragement for introspection. And that's what revival is. And we read about this in 1 Samuel chapter 7. Look at verse number 1. And the men of Kerjath Jerem came, Jerem came and fetched up the ark of the Lord. Now, God, the ark of God ha had not been in Israel, had not been in the corporate uh, tabernacle. They brought it to the house of Abinadab in the hill and sanctified Eleazar, his son, to keep the ark of God. And it came to pass while the ark abode in Kerjath Jerem, they got it out of the region of the Philistines, that the time was long, for it was 20 years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. They left the representation of the power of God in some dude's home for 20 years, and they, they didn't bring it to where it was supposed to be held. There's probably somebody in the room that's needed revival for a long time. I've needed it and for 20 years. They got it out of the land of the Philistines, but they didn't bring it home. But do you see it? They went, the, the, the men of Kerjath Jerem, they, they went, they took the ark of the Lord, they brought it to the house of Abinadab, but it wasn't supposed to reside in the house of Abinadab. It was supposed to reside in the tabernacle. It was supposed to reside where, where Samuel would have control of it. But for 20 years, it stays here. And the people of Israel are sad, but they're complacent and they do nothing. And so it seems like in verse number three that Samuel has this giant church service of sorts. Wasn't really church. I get that. I understand. But you get the idea. They had a massive cor uh, corporate meeting. And Samuel spake in verse number three unto all the house of Israel, saying, If you do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away, this, away the strange God and gods and Ashtaroth from among you and prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve him only and he will deliver you out of the hands of the Philistines. Then the children of Israel did put away Balaam and Ashtaroth and serve the Lord only. And Samuel said, gather all Israel to Mizpah and I will pray for you unto the Lord. And they gathered together to Mizpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said there, we have sinned against the Lord, and Samuel judged the children of Israel in Mizpah. I want you to notice a few things about a heart that is set on revival. And my prayer today is that that will be your heart, is that you'll have a passionate desire, a passionate hope, that your life would be revived by the Word of God, and that your relationship would be restored or repaired that that would be your heart's desire. Pastor, why are we having a special speaker come in and why is he preaching Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Monday night and Tuesday night? Because your life needs to be transformed and restored to the relationship it once had with the Lord. And so does mine. So what does Samuel tell the people to do? Verse number three, he says this, if you do return unto the Lord with all your hearts. Number one, if you're going to have a heart set on revival, there has to be a determination to walk with God, or you have to determine to walk with God. If you do return. Let's not lose sight of this reality. I'm speaking to believers here tonight. There is a choice that has to be made to walk with God. It's a choice. If you do return, it, it seems so often like we want the we want the Jesus shot or the Jesus pill or or we want the the the, the Jesus switch and, and people say why can't we just turn that switch on and be so much easier to serve the Lord if He let us why does He even give us personal choice Well, it's no real love if it's forced, and there needs to be a determination in your heart to walk with God. There needs to be a determination in your heart to live for God. If you choose not to live for God, what's the end state of that? 
And so Samuel says to the nation of Israel, hey, uh, people here, if you do return unto the Lord with all your heart, he says, I'm going to do some things for you. But first, it has to be a determination of your heart that God knows. The, the children of Israel had made some slight turns back to the Lord. They had turned a little. They were going this way. And they, 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 they went like this, you know, 10 degrees. They went 20 degrees. They went 30 degrees. And they vacillated, whatever it was, within this framework of contentment that like, I'm pretty good here. 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 And Samuel says, no, I, I want you, verse number three, to return unto the Lord with the totality of your heart. It's easy to get content giving Jesus 25%. Because you're giving him 25% more than your neighbors or your coworkers. It's easy to give Jesus even 50%, maybe 75%. But notice the requirement that Samuel makes. Determine to follow the Lord with all your heart. Samuel was not asking for a token acknowledgement that God was good. Samuel was not asking uh, for people to, 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 to come to church just on Sunday morning. Samuel was asking the people to follow God with all of their heart. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse number 14, Joshua talking to the children, uh, the children of Israel, and says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. As we look at our lives, we must realize that spiritually we are where we are because we've made the choice to be where we are. And we can be where God wants us to be if we make the choice to follow him with all of our heart. And revival confronts me for being me and you for being you. It's a big giant magnifying glass. And so Samuel says to the people here in such gracious but passionate ways, return unto the Lord with all your hearts. He says not only, not only do they need to determine to walk with God, they need to make Christ-centered decisions. That's how we would say it. Verse number three, put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you and prepare your hearts unto the Lord. Return to the Lord with your hearts and put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you. Make Christ-centered decisions. He, here's what's interesting. The Jews had gone so far from God that they were worshiping the gods of the Philistines, asking the gods of the Philistines to deliver them from the Philistines. They were worshiping the Canaanite gods, and the Canaanites were oppressing them, and they were asking the Canaanite gods to deliver them from the Canaanites. The scripture makes reference to Ashtaroth here in our text, and Ashtaroth from among you, which was uh, uh, the primary false god of the Canaanite, the goddess of fertility, love, and war. And, and they were worshiping these gods of the people that were oppressing them. And Solomon says, well, guys, turn back to the Lord with all your hearts and start making Christ-centered decisions. Exodus chapter 20, verse number three says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Friends, God will not share his throne with anyone. He'll not share his throne with anyone. In my life, yours, as I'm studying today, God began to convict me about some things that were in my own life. And I, like you, because we're all the same, I, like you, began to justify it. I began to kind of tell the Lord it's not that big a deal. And, and here's what God said. I told you to put this away. I told you to make this decision. Put away this God from you. Hey, no, nobody in this room would, would ever be content or, or feel right about somebody in our church worshiping a false God. 
I know that. If I, if I invited you in early and we had a line and it was a secret booth where you sat on one side and I sat on the other, we could even call it a confessional. And that was good, actually. You could still laugh during revival. Um, and I said, do you think, and I didn't know your name or whatever, and there's a, a curtain actually between us. And I said, hey, do you think it's okay for us to bow down and worship false gods? I, I have a feeling that there would probably be about a, a 95 to 100% uh, agreement that no, worshiping false idols is bad. But notice what the text says. Put away from among you strange gods and Astaroth from among you. Here's the idea. If there's something in your heart that you're holding on to that is in the way of the Lord, you're never going to have revival until you remove that. For them, it was these false gods. But for us, it might not be a a physical, tangible thing like, oh, I'm going to go worship the piano. But there might be something in our life that we put over our relationship with the Lord. And so in revival, if it truly happens, people give up things like anger. I'm just, I'm just going to give that anger up. People give up things like bitterness. I'm not bitter. I'm just protecting my heart from ever getting hurt again. Okay. During revival, people become like Jesus and become vulnerable. That's why people give up hatred. People give up resistance. Well, I know what God's calling me to do. He's calling me into vocational ministry, but I just, I can't make a lot of money in that. And and it's a lot of hours and not a lot of time. And so I'm just, I'm just going to kind of push back and I'm just going to stay here and be content. Christ-centered decisions just simply say, Lord, whatever you'd have me to do, that's what I'm going to do. I'm putting away anything that keeps me from you. I'm putting anyone that's in front of you in their proper place. Don't have to get rid of every friendship. I've heard people say that you need to have no friends but Jesus. That's dumb. That's anti-biblical. But he needs to be the first and the most important in your life. We need to give up animosity, jealousy, wrath, I mean, our church just in the last couple of months has seen, has seen anger do really devastating things to some people's lives. And he says, hey, you've got to get rid of these things. If you have a false God in your life, and let me stop and say this, if you aren't a Christian, if you don't know Christ as your personal Savior, then according to the Scripture, then you have a God in front of Jesus, you're worshiping a false God. It might be yourself or it might be some other religion. But if you're here tonight and you're not sure that if you died, heaven would be your home because you've not yet put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone, can I be super candid and honest with you? Then, then there is an eternal devastation that is headed your way. And though the point of revival is not specifically to see people saved, it's not an evangelistic event. It is what we call an in-reach event to affect the hearts and lives of the believers. But make no mistake, if you're here and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, can I encourage you today to, to realize that you're a sinner, repent of your sin, and accept the free gift that Jesus Christ offers of salvation to all mankind. To all mankind. He wants to save you. The Bible says he came to seek and to save that which was lost. Your job ought not to be in front of God. Your family shouldn't be in front of God. Your hobbies shouldn't be in front of God. Nothing should be in front of God. And notice how he ends this verse in, in verse number three. And he talks about the strange gods and Astaroth from among you. And prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve him only. And he'll deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. 
Well, Pastor, I mean, if God told me that he would get me out of this major problem with the Philistines, then yeah, I'd probably serve him too. Oh, okay, let's read it this way. You ready? It's the Chadwick, modern Chadwick version, MCV. And Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If you will return unto the Lord... Oh, here, we'll do it this way. Sorry. And Samuel spake unto all the house of Canyon Ridge, saying, If you'll return unto the Lord with all your hearts, and put away the strange gods and uh, your career from among you, and prepare you... You could add whatever you want in there for Ashtaroth. You just do your thing, all right? I'll let you. There's some freedom there. And... and, and um, and your family from among you, and prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the enemy. Oh, out of the hand of Satan's oppression. Out of the hand of joylessness. Out of the hand of friendlessness out of the hand of, this, this isn't a word, but you'll get it, peacelessness. It's going to be a word tomorrow on Twitter. Here's what God says. You do what I tell you to do. You have no idea the level of healing that I'm going to bring to your life. And so Samuel's third point in verse number three about serve him only is serve Christ passionately. Walk with God, make Christ-centered decisions, and serve Christ passionately. Find your greatest joy in serving Christ. Revivals begin with God's own people, as the Holy Spirit, said one author, touches their heart anew and gives them a new fervor and compassion and zeal, a new light and life. And when he thus comes to you, he next goes forth to the valley of dry bones. Oh, what responsibility this lays on the church of God. If you grieve him away from yourselves or hinder his visits, then the poor perishing world suffers sorely. Serve Christ passionately. Put away the other gods and prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve. You see that in the text? Serve him only. This is not new to the concept of the scripture. Love the Lord your God, God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. I mean, God is very, very clear that we as followers of Jesus Christ are to serve Jesus Christ in such a way that it's a testimony to other believers and it's a testimony to a lost and dying world. And serve him only. If you know me well, you, you know that I'm passionate about working out. I just, I just enjoy it. Just enjoy it. We were at the gym at zero dark 30 this morning, or 7.30. Not really zero dark 30, but it, it was dark in the other hemisphere. And, uh, and, I, and I loved it, and we got done and had a great time and pulling ourselves up off the floor. Those of us that were older and Zane Garz is, you know, dancing around because he's just a kid and uh, he's not even winded. He's like, hey, can we do it again, Pastor? Like, no, we got to go to work right now. And um, as Bernie and I are crawling to our cars and, and, uh, and uh, but I'm passionate about working out. I really, really, really enjoy working out. I'm passionate about my puppy. Uh, I love my puppy. She is amazing. I actually missed her a lot uh, while I was gone. I watched videos about many Bernadoodles. Debbie sending me videos about my dog. I, I love my dog. I'm showing videos about my dog like you guys do your grandkids. And uh, if you have grandkids, like, oh, look, my grandkid can stand on two feet. And because uh, that's what I'm doing with my dog. Like, oh, watch her stand. Watch her sit. Watch her eat. Um, watch her whine. Watch her say my name. She 
she can talk. Um, and uh, I, I love my dog. I love my wife. I love her more than I love my dog, by the way. And uh, I'm passionate about my dog, uh, or my, no, my wife, my wife. Let me get these things straight. Passionate about that. I'm quasi passionate about the San Antonio Spurs. I'm more passionate because we got the number one pick in the NBA draft last night, which I'm sure all of you were watching. Did anybody other than me watch it? Praise the Lord. Yes. I'm standing all by myself. That's all right. Good. But I'm still passionate about it. Some of you are not only didn't watch it, you're looking at me with disdain for watching it. Uh, pretty much if you know me, I'm a really passionate guy about just about anything. And if I don't enjoy it, I just really don't care at all. I mean, it's just like not my thing. Debbie and I went a walk last night on the beach and uh, over in La Jolla Shores. And and and, and we're just, we just had a good time. I'm passionate about La Jolla Shores. I heard today that Zane and Gavin got in the ocean last night. It was really cold. Zane goes, it wasn't that cold. He goes, actually, it was colder outside than inside the water. But then why was your wife in a winter coat in a tent? Because the water was cold, and she's from Florida and a sissy. But nonetheless, I'm passionate about a lot of things. My personality, it's who I am, passionate about a lot of things at the church. But, but you know what I really, really want to be known as? A guy who's passionate about the Lord passionate about the things of God. I enjoy a lot of things. I mean, I just enjoy a lot of things. Love them. Find the blessing of God in them. Worked outside in my yard yesterday for the first time in 10, 11 weeks other than just mowing it. I mean, got a lot of things done. Really enjoyed that. Not really passionate about it, but I enjoyed it. But I want to be more passionate about the creator of the yard than the creation of the yard. And revival aligns me there. But revival never brings, never happens if we are unwilling to ask God to search our hearts. That's why the psalmist said in Psalm 139, 23 and 24, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Revival never happens if work is the most important thing in all your life, or even family. Because then if your family has a bad day, and they will, your kids will have a bad day. Your spouse will have a bad day. You'll have a bad day. Everybody's going to have a bad day. We're in a sin-cursed world. And if your family has a bad day, th then, then everything is bad. But when Jesus is first, my kids might be having a bad day. My job might stink right now. The San Antonio Spurs didn't get the first pick. Um, it was really cold at the, at the beach. Not Cali cold, but it was really cold at the beach. Um, uh, the, every gym in the world has closed down. Um, and now all you can lift your donuts, um, which Bernie's passionate about, I might add. Um, if everything like that happens, let me tell you, we're still good because my real passion is the Lord himself. And so what I'm asking you to do tonight is four days before our revival starts on Sunday morning, and this is probably the first time we've called it a revival in quite a while. What I'm really asking you to do tonight is asking God to search your heart. Asking God to inspect your soul. And, and I'm asking you not to just do it tonight, but do it tomorrow when you're at school. And you're sitting in math class and you're doing quadratic equations and you're just like, Lord, while I do these unnecessary problems in life, or whatever. They're probably necessary. Somebody in here could come and say, Pastor, you know, here's why they're necessary, to which I would submit to that. But while you're doing those, Lord, how's my heart? Reveal to me in my heart what's wrong. Some teenagers in this room probably have a real attitude problem with their parents. And, and, and Samuel is helping us to understand some things here. Because if you notice verse number four, 
The children of Israel responded and they put away Balaam and Ashtaroth and served the Lord only. And he brought them to Mitzvah and he prayed for them and they gathered together in Mitzvah and they drew water and they poured it out before the Lord, meaning they offered an offering unto the Lord and they fasted on that day. They, they actually went without food to be closer to Jesus, which is the point of fasting. And, and let me tell you, I know people all over the world that can fast for health. And intermittent fasting, huge thing. Like, man, I, I've had people say, I can go 16 hours without fasting and, and without eating, and I can too. But as soon as it's a spiritual battle, I can go about three and a half seconds without being hungry and without wanting something to eat. And you might be better than me, but as soon as I tell the Lord, Lord, I'm just going to go without food so that I can be close to you, I crave everything. I mean, I, cr I crave in and out when I do that, and that never happens. They fasted and said, we've sinned against the Lord. Samuel judged the children of Israel in Mishpah. Jesus is talking at the Sermon on the Mount and towards the latter end of the message, he says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, no man can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You can't serve God and serve the things of the world at the same time. It's impossible. And what revival does is recalibrates us to saying, here's where the Lord is. And my prayer tonight, Julie's going to come in just a minute or John, and they'll play some music. And when they do, my prayer is tonight that you'll ask God to inspect your heart, that children will ask God to inspect their heart, that teens will ask God to inspect their heart, that adults will ask God to inspect their heart. And however God tells you to move, change, do, you'll be obedient to him, but you'll make a, a, a definite effort and, and make a definite choice to walk with God. You'll make Christ-centered decisions and you'll serve the Lord with passion in your life. Father, bless our time in the word. We're indeed thankful for it. And as we have opportunity,